summer offers us a different kind of rhythm. A pause from the ordinary, from the sometimes hectic pace, perhaps a space for quiet and rest. But we do not like space. We do not like empty. We do not like empty page, empty calendar, empty nest, empty bank account, empty stomach, empty space in conversation. Oh, we think we do, but we don't. Who among us has not craved on our calendar an empty day or even just an empty hour? But when we find it, we will fill it up with shopping or with television show or just a little picking up. Oh, we wish for empty, but in the end, it really makes us feel uncomfortable. As a parent, I wish for the pause from the constant litany of cook, clean, drive, work, cook, clean, drive, work, cook, clean, drive, work. When my children were younger, I would wish for quiet a pause from the constant, Mom, will you? Mom, she did. Mom, why? Mom, why not? But as soon as it gets quiet, we become suspicious, and rightly so, because every parent knows that silence often means trouble, of the something is broken or someone is hurt variety, or we are up to no good and something is about to get hurt. In the moment imposed upon us at a stoplight, a long line or a slow computer, we check our messages, send a tweet, write a list, update our status on Facebook, or at least check the status of others to make sure that we are keeping up. I have a counselor friend who I asked about this. I said, why do we do this? And he replied, because we are afraid. Afraid that we might get caught unprepared. Afraid of not keeping up afraid of losing control. I confess that I too am not so crazy about empty because in that moment of emptiness, I am out of control. If someone were to see that I have an empty moment, they might try to talk to me. <laughs> or they might ask me to do something for themselves, for them, or with them. And I have so much to do already. I don't tolerate empty in myself, and I don't tolerate it in others. My children would be witness to that, and my husband too. If I see someone in my house enjoying a little peace and quiet, I think of all the things they ought to be doing, should be doing. Like, why don't you go outside for a bike ride? How can you be sitting there when it's so still and quiet when your room is such a mess? Filling up our bellies, our cupboards, our calendars makes us feel important makes us feel like we are in control, makes us feel safe. I remember when my daughter Helen, who is now almost 20, was a toddler. She, like most toddlers, loved to play in her sandbox and to splash in the bathtub. We thought she would love the beach. We imagined her squealing with delight when, we, when she saw the wide open sandbox and the endless waters to splash in. The year before, as a baby, she was so peaceful when we carried her in her snuggly for long walks and when she sat in our laps and let the water kiss her feet. We awoke that first day at the beach to the toddler alarm and headed out to greet the day. I carried Helen, talking all the while about the wonderful things we would do and see. As we crested the dune, I saw that the tide was way out and the beach was wide. I turned her around and set her in the sand, waiting for delight to bubble out of her and my usually eager little girl to charge on chubby legs to the sea. She stood absolutely still. And then her body was blown back by the enormity of the space. In the moment before she turned and literally climbed back up my body into my arms and buried her head in my neck. There is nothing so disquieting as empty, especially if it is a soul, hungry, thirsty, afraid. The writer of Psalm 42 speaks of his thirsty soul, longing for God 
while all around him people are asking, where is your God? Where? Where is your God? The emptiness of a day without work to do, without the voice of a loved one, without the ability to do the things we used to do, or the funds to pay the bills, let alone to finance the overflowing life to which we had become accustomed, leaves us standing motionless, facing the ebb tide, wondering, where is God? Daunted, we turn and run, but not towards God. For we are afraid to wait and meet God in the silence. We run rather towards all the things that fill our life and squeeze out space for God, seeking to ease our hunger pains and quench our thirst with that which does not satisfy. Elijah had been on the high watermark of his prophetic career. The people of Israel and their king Ahab had been led astray by Jezebel, his wife. Jezebel's court was full of prophets of Baal and Asherah, while the land and its people were suffering a drought. Their wells were running dry. Elijah called out, to the, people, called out the people of Israel and the prophets of Baal for a showdown in which God held a decisive victory, consuming with fire the sacrifice that Elijah had doused with water. Elijah slaughtered the prophets of Baal and the life-giving rains returned to Israel. When Jezebel's husband Ahab, the king of Israel, returned to report to her all that Elijah had done, she focused not on that wonderful, miraculous sacrifice. She focused not on the return of the rains to the land, but rather on the loss of her prophets. Jezebel vowed to pursue Elijah until he became like one of her defeated prophets. Out of fear for his life, Elijah ran out into the expanse of the wilderness, empty, drained, having poured out his soul, zealous for the Lord and pursued by Jezebel. In the soul-draining, energy-sapping wilderness of fear, Elijah lies down to die, believing himself to be no better than his ancestors. Hmm. I wonder what ancestors he was thinking of. Probably he was thinking of the other prophets of Yahweh that Jezebel had eliminated. Yes, he might be like those, but the rest of this part of Elijah's story reminds me of some of Elijah's ancestors who, like Elijah, needed God. Who, like Elijah, needed wide open space. For they too were pursued by an angry ruler. With seemingly no way out, God pushed back the water of the Red Sea and made, gave them a space, the space they needed to distance themselves from the army that pursued them. Like the manna supplied to the Hebrews on their journey out of slavery, Elijah is fed in the wilderness and strengthened for the journey ahead. And like Moses, their leader, Elijah ascends Horeb, the mountain of God the same mountain that Moses called Sinai. When Moses climbed up this mountain, God met him with commandments for his people. Among those commandments was to remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy, to labor for six days, but to rest on this one. The openness, the empty space is a gift to those of us who are no better than our ancestors. To those of us who cannot fill our own emptiness, find our own way out, or save our own lives. It is a time to be fed, a time to let go, a time to remember that we are not alone. Sometimes Sabbath is thrust upon us when we are utterly spent, when a surgery limits our ability to do for ourselves, or even when the battery goes dead on our smartphone. Weekly, Sabbath is offered to us. Like the rhythm of the tides, Sabbath pulls back the urgent waves of self-sufficiency and leaves open a wide space to listen, to talk, to play. 
When Elijah climbs up the mountain, God comes to him too. Not in the full score of rock-splitting wind, or in the rumble of an earthquake, or in the pop and crackle of fire, but in silence. My musician friends tell me that a rest is just as important as any note in a musical score. The rest gives us time to soak up that which has gone before and to prepare for that which comes next. In the early 1950s, John Cage, inspired by the white paintings of Robert Rauschenberg, composed a piece of music called Four Minutes and 33 Seconds. It can be played on any instrument, for it consists of the musician sitting down with her instrument for a four minute and 33 second rest. (laughs) The composer and musician release control of the piece, allowing the sounds that are heard to be the sounds of the audience and the environment. Much the same way that Rauschenberg's white paintings provide a blank canvas that would be colored by the shadow of the observer the play of light, and the dance of floating dust. In the silence between God and Elijah, they are present with one another. I imagine that silence gives Elijah to reflect on that which has gone before and to prepare for that which will come next. A time to hear God's question, What are you doing here, Elijah? And to know that God will listen to the answer. I have been very zealous for the Lord, but the Israelites have forgotten. They have killed your prophets, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. I imagine that silence gives Elijah time to let go, to look at the canvas before him and to see the interplay of his shadow with God's light. And to remember that he is not alone. To remember that the security of his life is not in his own striving, but in the sometimes silent embrace of God. There, in that quiet time with God, the raging waters of Elijah's anxiety are pushed aside, and the path forward becomes clear. When you leave this place, God tells Elijah, you will anoint a new king for Aram, a new king for Israel, and a successor for yourself. Today we will anoint successors for our elder class. We will ordain a new class of elders. And the class that has just retired has served us so well, but it is their time for a little rest and for someone else to take up the mantle. Sabbath rest gives us space to hear God's still small voice, to see God's light playing on the canvas, and to see the path that God has set out before us. In her book, Sabbath in the Suburbs, Mary Ann McKinnon Dana relates the following story about director Alfred Hitchcock. When actors would get stuck on a scene, Hitchcock would come in and start clowning around with them to lift the tension. Invariably, the actors would have a breakthrough and get back on track. Later, Hitchcock would explain his tactics, saying, You were pushing. It never comes through pushing. Our fear pursues us, and we think that if we just work harder, push harder, fill up the spaces, that we will come through on the other side. The empty space of Sabbath rest, whether it is thrust upon us or is a practiced rhythm in our lives, gives us time to stop pushing against our fear, to stop pushing to make things happen. It gives us time to gain perspective and see God's way before us. Everyone asks the psalmist, Where? Where is your God? I believe the answer is in Elijah's story and the story of his ancestors. God is in the emptiness, in the silence, in the open space. God is, the path, is in the path through the Red Sea, a space to move from slavery to freedom, from fear to promise. 
God is in the dry land of the wilderness, bringing streams from rocks, bringing water in bottles, raining manna from heaven, and delivering cakes baked on stones. God is on the mountaintop, commanding the ways of life, listening to our complaints and pointing the way forward. In the quiet moment on the mountaintop, God asks Elijah, why are you here? Elijah confesses, I have been zealous. I am alone. They are seeking my life. Like Helen on the beach, Elijah has climbed into the arms of the one who holds his life. When we are faced with emptiness, we need not to continue to push to fill it or to stand immobilized by fear. But we too might climb into the ever-present steadfast love of God. Through the rhythm of our annual pilgrimage to the beach, Helen has learned the gift of low tide. The receding of the sea gives us a broad space to soak up the sun, to dig in the sand, to walk with a friend, to find treasures trapped in tide pools, and to net crabs for tasty meals. Through the rhythm of the Sabbath, we learn the gift of emptiness, for in disquieting space we have found time to listen and be listened to, a time to rest from our pushing, a time to remember and to hope, a time to imagine a clear path forward. I believe that if we practice this rhythm of rest, we prepare our lives ourselves for the time when rest is thrust upon us, for the full stops that can be so frightening. For when we are debilitated by depression, exhausted from work and can go no further, when we have been diagnosed with disease, we will know how to turn to the one who stands in the space with us, who will hold us and ask us, why are you here? And will listen patiently to our answer. This summer, as we enjoy a different rhythm, as we go to meet beach or mountain, to sanctuary or even to bed rest, may we welcome the empty space as a place, a time where we might be met by God, a space where we might listen and be listened to, where our memory will remind us to hope and where we might be sustained for the journey and the way ahead might be made clear. Amen.